sign and do all the introductions everywhere we go. That's a, thank you. Appreciate it. That's a great honor. The only issue with the uh, elevation and the height, the vertical leaf, my son reminded me that uh, as I continue to eat Mr. Lonnie's pork chops, I'm getting less and less height <laughs> every time on my, my vertical leaf. I've already been here uh, twice now since the national championship. So uh, appreciate what you do, Lonnie, what you guys do here. And uh, I don't know how many people in this community don't know Allison Evans, but if you don't know Allison Evans and what she does here at the Methodist home, it's absolutely incredible, and I'd be remiss if I didn't at least point to Miss Allison in the back, wave at everybody, Miss Allison. I feel like we're really starting to get to know each other pretty good now that I've been here seven years. We come every year with every head coach in a five-hour radius, and then I get to come to this event, so that's seven times two. I guess 14 times I've had pork chops. I'll blame it on that, so <laughs> maybe it's something else. But I would also like to thank our sponsors tonight. You know, this event wouldn't be possible without all the great people in this community that want to recognize high school sports. And it's more than just these guys up front. It's the guys all over this room. It's the, the, the females that aren't here that play athletics, and, and you can't have high school sports nowadays without sponsors and people that are willing to help spend money to make these sports possible. You know, and it's really sad that in the world we live in today, a lot of the sports are going away because they don't have the finances. You know, there's a lot of states out west, they've now got to go and uh, fund their own sports and go out and raise money. And at least here uh, in the state of Georgia, we've got a great education system. We've got great people in the communities. I always say we have the best coaches in the country, and without that, we wouldn't have the sports we have. So the sponsors, I certainly appreciate you guys, and thank, thank you for what you do. There's also a... Uh, I always say, givers gain. And when you got an opportunity to give back, please do that and uh, acknowledge it. There's also a special dog here in the house tonight that's uh, become a good friend of mine, and uh, I'd like to recognize Governor Kemp who's over here with us. Yeah. think when, when things are tough and it's third and eight, you don't know what to call, or third and four and you can't stop somebody, or things aren't going well, you could be the governor of the state where everybody questions everything you do. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's a tough job to get second guessed. Only the, the quarterback in Georgia gets more criticism. <laughs> so, honored to have you here, and, and obviously he's a great dog. Um, so, with that, I want to share a little bit about where we were, and share a little about a little bit about where we're headed. Uh, my family, who's not with me tonight, obviously, but uh, I have a nine-year-old son and 14-year-old twins, boy-girl twins. One thinks she's gonna be a basketball player, although she's not. She thinks she's gonna be a basketball <laughs> player like her mom, so she's on the AAU circuit. Then I got a 14-year-old boy that's on the tennis circuit. So we spend about half our weekends in Macon, playing the Macon Tennis Center, or we go to Rome for the Rome Tennis Center. So I've got basketball, I've got tennis covered, and then my nine-year-old son plays football, basketball, baseball, and he thinks he's one of our players. He tells me all the time, Dad, you're playing the wrong quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, he, he, Andrew's got it all figured out. Somewhere or another, he always finds a way to the camera. So he's in a lot of pictures and a lot of things, but tonight's his first baseball game, so I'm trying to be the good dad because I haven't been home for about four nights kind of on the road speaking to get back to his game. So he pitches tonight at 7.30 in Little League and uh, plays a little travel ball. So I'm going to try to skedaddle out of here afterwards, which I normally don't do that. You don't, I normally can stay for the whole event, but I do want to get back to see him play and get to be there to watch him, which is uh, very important to me that I get to be part of my kids' life because I spend a lot of time chasing after these guys. So uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here tonight and certainly coming off such a special season. But I tell our players all the time, you know, we're not we're not defending anything. So many people want to know, are you going to repeat? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Hey, we have a, a very simple plan every year to get the most out of every team that we coach. And we tell our coaches that because a lot of times in life, there's going to be outside pressure. And I want the young men and parents of the young men in this room to hear me now. The expectations that are placed upon you a lot of them are not even earned. They've been given to you. They've been uh, given, these accolades have been given to you. And you have a large step and obligation in front of you to continue playing this game the right way. 
I got the great fortune this year of being on a rules committee. And uh, the rules committee in Indianapolis, I had to go sit on the rules committee. And I thought it was interesting. You know, we talked about rules that could help the game, make it safer, right? A little less concussions, a little less targeting. We got a lot of things that are topics of interest on the rules committee. But probably the, one of the most interesting things I got out of two days sitting on a committee of 14 hour days talking about rules was that our game is at a deficit for officials. The high school game is deteriorating because there are very few officials. And I thought that was interesting. I thought, well, why, why are there less officials? Is it because maybe COVID hit and there's a safety issue there? You know, people at risk maybe of age, um, maybe some comorbidities there and they just, they, they, can't, uh, they can't officiate. But no, they polled all these officials that aren't officiating anymore. I said, what was the number one reason why you feel like you don't want to officiate anymore? And you know what the number one thing was? Lack of sportsmanship. And I blame that, I personally blame that on myself as a coach and the coaches that coach the game. Because if you don't demand discipline from your players, what is discipline? Doing what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, how you're supposed to do it, whether anybody's watching or not. That's, that's what discipline is. And if we don't instill that in our teams, in our young men, our young women, we'll deteriorate. I mean, officials walk away from the game saying there's a lack of sportsmanship, and they say, well, that's your job to officiate. No, it's our job as coaches to instill it. And you do that by how you, uh, what you demand of your players. I say all the time, our players really, really do want discipline. They seek it. A lot of times, they do things just to get attention. And if you demand it, they'll do it. They'll conform to it. And no greater example of that than what we had last year on our team. You know, it got to the point where what Nicobe Dean said, what Jamari said, what Zeus said, what those captains said is what stood. And there was no void of leadership in that team. I've never in the history of coaching, and I've been to some really good places, most college coaches, high school coaches, they allow the players to vote on who the captains are. So it's not a coach decision, right? Most of these kids can see right through it when, when uh, the coach says, hey, he's going to be the leader of the team. If it's coach appointed, it's not credible. It's not credible. But what is credible is when you say, I want you guys to vote and tell me who the captains are. Well, we wait until most of the year's done. Most of the time, we do it around the SEC championship game. This year, I decided I'm going to do something different. I'm going to wait. So we voted the night before the Michigan game in the Orange Bowl. Pretty long way in the season. It's just a tough, tough decision when you got 10, 11, 12 really good leaders on your team and you can only name four captains. Well, we did the votes. We said everybody could vote for three people. So you can imagine there's 130 people in the room, three votes per 130. Okay, so, so everybody got to vote three times out of the 130 guys. And uh, Kobe Dean broke a record for our team. He got 115 of the 130 votes. You know, the most we'd ever had before was about 105, which was Aziz, actually. So when that happened, it told me these guys won't discipline. Because the one guy that was probably the most disciplined on our team was Nicobe Dean. Th th this young man was different, okay? It's very easy when you go in a meet. You know how you have your meet for the first time in uh, spring and everybody's jacked up, everybody's ready to go practice football, fall camp. I hadn't practiced in a while. I'm ready to go practice football. Everybody's, everybody's just pumped, and they do everything you say. They're on time. They, they, they're there. They're in their seat. They're sitting upright. Everything's exactly like you want it to be. But about week four, week seven, oh, man, I'm sore. I'm not feeling too good. Maybe I'm not playing as much as I think I should play. Things are starting to question in my head. I'm not taking notes the right way. We're playing Alabama in the SEC championship game, and I remember vividly sitting in the defensive meeting where I said a lot of times, Coach Lanning's going over the rules, the adjustments, how we're going to play the red area, how we're going to do this, how we're going to do this. And I look down there, and Kobe Dean is front and center with his pen and paper out, writing down his notes for the, for the, for during, the, during the meeting. And we encourage everybody to take notes, right? Maybe be similar to the, you know, your mom and dad encouraged you to go to church on Sundays. You didn't always go. You knew you were supposed to go. Well, these guys know they're supposed to go take notes. 
Well, but Kobe's doing it that, that late in the year, and there's a play in that game you guys can watch. A lot of college teams do it. The, the, the quarterback acts like he's looking over the sideline. I know you guys know what I'm talking about. They usually check the sideline. They look over. And we had told him, if the quarterback doesn't move and he just looks over, you don't look back over. You stay right there. You stay put. You don't look at Coach Landing. We're not changing the call. And sure enough, Bryce Young looked over. And then snapped the ball. And our whole defense was looking back at Coach Landing to see the check. And they got hit. And Jacoby Dean never moved. He knocked the hell out of the back and tapped him right there. And I thought, <laughs> man, that guy listens. Now, I didn't make a hill of beans and we got our ass beat that day. <laughs> he still earned the respect. He still earned the respect of so many because of the discipline that he had, okay? And I really think that today's day and age, they seek discipline, we don't always supply it. We don't confront and demand. If a young man walks into to my office and he's not following our team rules, our team rules are simple. We can wear earrings, we can wear things like that. I'm great with that. We just don't wear it when we're practicing. It's not safe. So we don't wear it when we're practicing. We wear it when you travel. Just ask him to take it out. It's conformity. You want to have guys that want to have discipline and do things the right way. And the best thing about this group is I didn't have to make them. They made each other. And, you know, I look around the room now. We've got a team meeting now. We're going through. We've had three practices right now. We're going on our fourth practice tomorrow. And I'm like, man, I worry about the leadership void. I worry about not having the group. But what's happening is contagious. They all want to be that guy. They want to be the guy now that confronts demands. They want to be the guy that steps up and says, hey, we got to practice harder. I go to one of those guys, they take it over in the meetings, and they say, hey, this ain't how we're going to do things. And to me, that's a culture that you can kind of start to create. Okay, I'm going to share another story with you because I'm big on stories and not words. All right? And I love stories. So I got a call from a coach that I've known for a long time in the NFL. He actually was coaching the NFL when I had a brief, real brief <laughs> stay at the NFL myself. They called a cup of coffee. I was there for about three months and, and, and got cut five preseason games. But I always kept a relationship with the coach that cut me. He's bounced around the NFL. He's been everywhere. Of course, he's signed and drafted a lot of the players that I had at FSU, LSU, or Alabama, and now in Georgia. So, obviously, he's old as hell because I'm getting old. <laughs> but he's a really good football coach. Okay, and he called me and he said, you would be so proud of this young man. Guy by the name of Channing Tindall. Some of you may know who he is, you may not, he's number 41. Um, but he sat in the room, and their job at the combine, which you hope you get the opportunity to go to the combine, means you're one of the top 300 players probably in the country. And they put you in a room, and they question you. They have psychological evaluations. They got ways to try to get under your skin. They're trying to come at you a different way. And, of course, you're trying to put on your best front, right? You want to sit up right. You got your coat on. You're, you're ready to talk. You're interviewing for a job. Oh, by the way, it also has to be a job that can pay you six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars a year, straight out of college. Pretty good job, right? Would y'all take six or seven hundred thousand coming out of college? <laughs> yeah. it's hell of a deal, if you ask me. So he's there interviewing the combine, and they trying to get under skin. I'm not going to name the team, and they said, "Well, you know, Channing, you you never started it, Jordan. You never started a game. How does that make you feel?" Well, what is the response they're looking for? Jealousy, envy, you know, two other linebackers that are really good players and his best friends. And he could easily have said, the coaches, you know, they, they didn't do me right. I should have been. Or, you know, he's probably not enough to say that to the coach, right? So he's, he's, he, 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 he doesn't say that. He says, you know, actually, I started every game in Jordan for four years. I started on punt team. I started on kickoff. I started on kickoff return. I started on punt return. And at our place, the University of Georgia, special teams mean so much that when you start on that, you're more honored than you are as an offensive or defensive starter. And the guy was like, wow. <laughs> wow. And it meant more to that general manager, that coach, that he had uh, the wisdom to avoid the train wreck of a question and answer it the way he saw it. And I'm so proud because... Uh, Coach Muschamp actually stood up in our first meeting, the very first special team meeting we had, when he took over special teams and said, if you start on one of these units, you're a starter at Georgia. And that stuck with Channing. And he played a lot. I mean, he played more snaps than some of those other guys. He played a ton, just didn't start. And that embodied what that team meant, okay? Because there were people, I said, I asked a kid before a game, I said, what's the difference in this team and the other teams? He said, Coach, we always knew 
like what our role was here. Like if I'm a, I'm not a starter and I'm a special teams player, if my role is to kick the field goal, they all knew what their role was, but they didn't necessarily buy into it. Okay, they didn't like buy into it. There's two things. You may know what your role is. Your role, we may ask you to run down there and blow somebody up on kickoff. We may ask you to, to close and spill the ball so another guy can make the tackle, right? Some of us have to do things to hold people up so somebody else can make the tackle. Well, guess what? Knowing that role and buying into that role are two different things, right? And we had a group that really bought into that, okay? So as we move forward to this year, we're trying to use those same earmarks to move that forward. We've had tremendous energy and enthusiasm. We're doing our skull sessions, and I always explain this, but I want to make sure you understand. A skull session is basically a small group. You have small groups at church. When you go out, you break out into your small groups. Our small groups are probably the size of these tables, but they go into their own room. And each room is represented by a different, uh, uh, different position, a different race, <coughs> different ethnicity, different age groups. We bring them all in there, and we talk. We talk about what's going on in the world. We talk about things that are, that are irrelevant, don't even matter to football. Okay? Then we talk about leadership and what it looks like. We talk about confronting and demanding. And we make freshmen talk. We make seniors talk. And what happens is guys get comfortable. They get what we call connected. They, they talk and they spend time with each other. You should try it sometime. Where's one of these things at? This is not how you stay connected, right? This is not how you stay connected, all right? So you want to stay connected, you have to talk to somebody. I know it's hard because I have kids too that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that want to be on those all the time. But I really think it's a long lost art to communicate with someone especially someone that might not think like you, might not look like you, might not act like you, but you know what? When we're in that locker room, we're all a team. And those kids have bought into that. They bought into knowing each other. And what I found is that we find out a lot more about the walk-ons when we do that and they share their stories. And the, the scholarship players appreciate the walk-ons more because they're doing it for free. For free. They're out there doing it. And some of those guys are like, man, I don't know how you do it. But they do it because they love the University of Georgia and they want to be there. So I'm very proud of where this team is. I'm proud of what this team's doing. We've only had three practices. We've got a long way to go, guys. It's not like that you're going to sit there and say, we've got all the answers. We don't. Our team is not where it was last year at this time. But you know what? It's headed in the right direction. It's on schedule. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the leadership we've had. And I'm also really proud that I'm able to be the head coach at the University of Georgia because that's a spot that – Many would like to be at, and a lot of them don't know what all it entails, the pressure it, it brings, but it's something for me that I, I, I honestly believe that I have a chance to change young men's lives by what we do. And the day that I stop having discipline, the day that I stop having energy is the day I don't want to coach anymore. Okay? Somebody come in there and tell me, Coach, you're not pushing me hard enough, I'm going to hang my shoes up. Because I'm going to push, I'm going to demand. I'm going to demand it of my coaches and my players because I want them to be better men for having come to the University of Georgia. Okay? And that's really what the game of football does. This is not about Georgia. This is about the game of football and what it teaches young people, which I think is important. Okay? I'm going to get off my soapbox now and open it up to, to any questions you guys have. I can share any stories or anything looking forward that you guys might have questions uh, for me. See there, nobody wants to ask. I'm trying to get back to my son's game. <laughs> yeah, he asked, I've had a lot of coaching changes to our staff. Am I where I need to be now? I, I want to be real honest. I think a lot of times, and, and my dad always told me this best, sometimes change is good for everybody. Sometimes change is good. I mean, think about it. If you don't change anything for a long time, you'll continue to get the same results guaranteed. And it, it change has been great for us. Now, here's what happens. There's one or two things that you can do to change. You can win and lose coaches, or you can lose and get fired. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm picking this one. Right? What, you, what, you become, what you become good at is interviewing in the selection process. You know, I, I'm fortunate that I'm with one of these guys that got rushed into a head job that – I learned to be patient when this happens. Don't panic. Don't panic. Relax. Go find a really good coach. Maybe you find an upgrade. Maybe you find a person that's got another strength and you got to pull from somewhere else. But within your organization, you're trying to put people in there that care about these young men.
And I think the four coaches I've hired, they, they've had the most energy all spring of anybody because they're new. They're fired up. They're ready to get after it. And that kind of reinvigorates me. You know, it's like this, there's this new energy. There's a new way to do it. So I'm really excited. Are we where we need to be? I don't know that, but I know that we got four good coaches. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't have long enough to go through a minute. I mean, I did take a long time to describe that. He asked about how NIL money will impact college football over long long term. I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know that. But I do think there's a lot of uh, misnomers out there. There's a lot of people that think this is like the golden egg and the golden goose. What's going to happen? It's going to separate the haves and have-nots. You know, so it's already that way. Let's let's be honest. Okay, the, 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 the SEC schools that bring in the television contract from the SEC, Texas, Oklahoma, possibly coming in, you know, coming into the conference, there's going to be the haves and have-nots already, but that disparity is going to even grow greater, okay? And, and be sure of one thing, there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there. There's a lot of stuff that says, oh, these kids are going to get guaranteed money coming in. That's not necessarily the case. You know, what they can see is what a kid like uh, uh, Jordan Davis is a good example. So Jordan Davis had NIL deals last year, and he's a he's a product of number one being a really good player, right? He wasn't the same player at the end that he was at the beginning. He wouldn't have had the NIL value at the at the beginning that he has at the end. So where it heads, I don't think anybody knows, um, but it's certainly uh, uh, changing really fast. Like the the advent of NIL and portal combined was more explosive than maybe people anticipated. But we're all learning how to manage it. And look, I think it's a good thing for the players to be able to get in. I think that's a good thing. I just think there has to be a measure of at what point are we deteriorating the game or taking away from the game. Because there's probably going to be another sport that ends up going under because of this. Because there's not going to be enough funds to go around when you start looking at it. And it'll impact a lot of schools' facilities. Because the same people that are going to give NIL opportunities are going to be the people that were given for, for facilities. So when you look at it that way, it's going to de deteriorate some. Yes. Coach, congratulations. You uh, you hardly had enough time pre-championship uh, to do everything you wanted to do, needed to do. Can you give us an idea now, post-championship, just a little bit of how your life has changed and what it's like, just all the demands on you? Yeah, I, I honestly don't think he asked uh, the demands pre-championship to post-championship. The biggest issue I probably had was I had a lot of things that I had committed to speaking-wise. That, that got pushed to this year for because of COVID. I couldn't do this, I couldn't do this, I couldn't do this. So they're all booked. Well, then when we won the championship, you usually get a lot more calls to get booked, and I was already booked. Yeah. So it's just uh, compounded that part. But look, I, I don't. I, I could have gone all the years as University of Georgia head coach or, or a defensive coordinator somewhere in the country, and I'd have been okay if I never won a national championship because I don't do it just for that. Like, I really don't. I do it because of the relationships I have with the players. I do it for when Channing Tindall goes across that stage and his diploma. Like, that, to me, is, is where I get – I mean, I love spring because I'm not dealing with all those things. I get to coach football. That's why I do it. That's my passion. So, the championship is just something on top of that. I'm very thankful for the Georgia fans in this room that have waited so long and all the grown men that were crying when <laughs> Kenny Ringo ran that back. I'm proud and happy. I wasn't to that point. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't to that point. But I certainly understand the people that had been to the last one and now they're at that one, how much it meant, how special it was to them. Because I'm going to be honest, the University of Georgia has been good to me and my family. We both went to school there. So I want to give back. And I only want the people that want to come there that want to be there. Look, I'm not interested. If you have no interest in working hard and being part of this, don't commit to me. Don't don't commit to us. Because we're going to work. And we're going to have discipline. And we're going to do things the hard way because I really believe that's the only way. I heard a guy speak the other night. He said, you know, everybody always talks about luck, luck, luck. And I, 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 it resonated with me because all I got told all my life was how lucky I was, how lucky I was. And he said, my daddy told me that the harder you work, the more luck you get. And I was like, well, I'll be. The harder you work, the luckier you get. Ain't that something? So if you go bust your butt and you go work hard, by God, you, you're eventually going to get some luck. And uh, I thought that statement resonated because that has really embodied um, what I've tried to do is, is work really hard and, and hope you get lucky at some point. So you have some questions? Can you, I hate to say this question, but can you explain the difference between the regular season defense and 
Yeah, uh, I, I couldn't hear him because he asked about the difference in the defense, the SEC championship game that, that, that didn't play real well, and then the, uh, the, the Orange Bowl that did, and then the, you know, the national championship. You know, I know you find this hard to believe, but a lot of the calls we had were the exact same calls. Okay? I really believe there's two differences. Okay? The number one difference is we won four out of five in the red area. Okay? When you win the red area, that's four points every time. And if they happen to go for it, it can be a seven-point swing. Okay, so we did not win the red area in the first game. All right, we didn't win the red area at all. We, we didn't stop them in the red area. We had chances to, but we didn't stop them in the red area. We did stop them in the red area in the championship game, and we were in much better shape. But we were in better shape also because we got off the field on third down. So when you have a third down conversion, it uh, exaggerates how in shape you are. Why? Because you got to go play three more. Then you got to play three more. Then you got to go play three more, and we got tired quick. So. I take the blame in the first game that we weren't in the shape we needed to be in, but we didn't stop them on third down. And I told our players, you want to be fresh? Get your butt off the field on third down. You'll be fresh because the next time you go out there, you'll still be fresh. So we had a lot of guys, and, and, and right after the Michigan game, I told them, I told five players, if you want to win the national championship, you got to get up at 6.30. We had 10 days. You got to get up at 6.30 every day for five days and run extra. And you don't have to do it because I can't not play you. I'm not going to not play you. I'm talking about the guy. I'm not going to name the guys, but they were going to play. They were good players, right? But if you want to win that championship, go 6.30 in the morning, five days. They all did it. And you know what? It paid off because they lost some weight. They had better conditioning. But we won third down, and we won red area, which was big. And our offense didn't play as well as they did probably the first game, at least in the first half. But they kept chopping wood, and they were more physical in the fourth quarter, which was probably what made the difference. Yeah. Just uh, he asked what I shared with Coach Dooley after the game. Coach Dooley's legendary coach that I kind of grew up watching when he was at Georgia and uh, got a lot of respect for him and what he's done for the University of Georgia. He's given his entire life, dedicated his entire life to the University of Georgia, other than when he went to Auburn as a player. But he didn't dedicate that to Georgia. <laughs> but he, uh, he's been a major role model for me. And I got a lot of respect for Coach Dooley, and I know how much it meant to him to be able to see that, that 41 years go by and just thank him for all he had done. I really don't remember what I said. I was in tears at that point and just happy for him. So, yeah, Johnny? That's an official day. Y'all be careful. <laughs> you can throw P.I. on your hurry.
I'm big on getting outside information. We've got a guy, Drew Brandon, that did a tremendous job with our team from the uh, mental side, the psychological side, and I'm much more into that now at 46 than I was at 35. And these guys are sitting here saying, what in the hell are you talking about the mental side? But I'm telling you, it matters more now than it ever has, okay? And the pressure that these young men are under from social media, expectations, ratings, they don't even know. Like, they don't even know they don't know. They don't even know that they don't know. And they get there, I'm watching it right now, with 19 mid-years, my heart goes out to them. Because it's coming fast. It's coming. I'm not talking about just the football players. I'm talking about academics. I'm talking about social media. I'm talking about expectations from family. I'm talking about demands. I'm talking about NIL. I'm talking about portal. I'm talking about, it's a lot, man. It's a lot. So our job is to hire people to help them navigate that. And I don't do that myself. There's no way I could do that. We've got a tremendous staff that pours into these young men so they can be successful. And you know what? we got one of the best facilities in the world that I can thank the alumni in this room and other places that have given back to share. we got a Bones dining hall. It's unbelievable. We've got an unbelievable training room. We've got an enormous weight room. But all these things we have are there to support them. So if you're willing to take it and accept it, but you know what? If they don't do it in high school, what I find, whatever they do in high school, they don't, they don't change. If they go to class and do what they're supposed to do, they do the same thing for us. And if they don't, they won't do it for us. So to me, we want to support them and grow them and make sure we're signing the right kind of kids in our program because the culture in the locker room is everything now. Everything now. Because it's too easy to quit. It's too easy to, to walk away and leave. I can go somewhere else, coach. You want to discipline me? I'll just go somewhere else. You know, I don't, I'd rather have that already decided before you sign those papers. But you're agreeing to do it the right way and stay with us and stick with us. Now, that's not to say that, that we, we have kids that graduate and play three years or four years and might not be playing as much as they think. I think that's a great avenue to go find somewhere to go play when they've done that. Yes, sir, in the back. How do you feel about our Bennett? Well, I can't talk about any prospects. Just like I can't talk about these guys, I'm not allowed to talk about any prospects. So uh, I unfortunately can't answer that question. But I knew I'd get a quarterback question. I just didn't know it would be about a recruitment. <laughs> Yes, sir. What's your, what's your advice for someone who wants to take a bounce to the next level but hasn't been given a shot yet? Uh, find a way. He asked what, what would your advice would be for someone who wants to take their talents to the next level but hasn't been given a shot yet. I, I, I would say your best shot is what you put on tape and what you've already put on tape. So you're obviously you have a plan to go to college. Um, look, there's a guy started for us last year in the national championship game, Dan Jackson, who didn't have one offer. He walked on to the University of Georgia. And he made his dream come true. Now, I would argue he was probably passed over by a lot of teams and missed. But that happens all the time with us. We, we've probably had 10 kids since I've been there go from walk on to scholarship because they earned it. And there's certain levels of that. I mean, certainly it's going to be hard to play at, at, at the University of Georgia as a walk on, but it's not hard to play some places. There's more and more football is, is a, a dying breed. Some kids just don't want to do it. It's too tough for them. I'll take about two more. Yes, sir. I know it. I'm, I'm going to get there. He's going to pitch late. Yeah. He's a strength coach, so he does a lot. He, he works really hard. He works a lot of long hours. He lifts a lot of weights so that he can pull me back. He's also the one that usually pushes me up when I jump. So he's uh, that guy's name that does the levitation. He, 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 he gets me to levitate over there when I have to. Yes, sir. moment of the game was probably when, when we, we beat uh, Missouri at home and we came in the locker room and I was displeased with how we played, didn't think we played real good, thought we were sloppy and took the game easy and about four players stood up and went off on the team and to me that's when we won the championship because I was like, Man, we just won by 20 something, 30 something, I don't know, and they, they went off in the locker room and they told every guy, you better be your butt in the locker room, you better be your butt in the weight room tomorrow morning or I'm coming after you. And I said, we're good. <laughs> but I, I don't think you, you don't, I don't think you win a key moment in that championship game. I really don't. I, I, I just, I think there's too many things that happened before that. You know, I thought halftime was really good. Some guys really talked and we couldn't have really played much worse in the first half and, and still in a tight ball game. So they handled that well. But 
Look, I'm proud of the, the guys we got on the team. I'm proud of the guys we got coming back. We're going to have a really good football team. I'm excited about where we're headed. I'm excited about Georgia football. But tonight is not about that, okay? It's about these young men in this room, all of them, and what they've done for high school football, for their high school teams. Look, you sacrifice a lot. If you didn't play high school football, you sacrifice your summer, you sacrifice your mornings, you sacrifice your evenings, and you do it all the time. You say, well, they do it for scholarship. Not all of them are going to get that. Not all of them are going to get that. Some of them are going to get that. But what I want to leave these young men with is sportsmanship, play the game the right way, appreciate the game. The game will give back to you. Okay? Thank you guys and go dogs.